You think I can't manage? He said huffily. Gordon knows better. He says I'm sagacious. You may be good gracious, or whatever you call it, but trucks can be troublesome and... Say no more, Doc, interrupted Donald. It's maybe a pity, but the wee engine will have to learn for himself. Oliver pulled some loaded trucks to a siding and pushed the empties to the chute. Then he came back to take the loaded trucks away. They were comfortable and didn't want to move. What right has he to poke his funnel in here, they grumbled. We want Duck or Donald or Douglas. Look sharp, puffed Oliver. That's not the way to speak, hissed the trucks. We'll pay him out. Oliver heard nothing. The trucks moved smoothly at first, then suddenly Oliver felt them push forward. His driver applied the brakes, but they were useless against the surging trucks. On, 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 yelled the trucks. Oliver fought hard, but still they forced him on and on. At last, the trucks grew tired. I'm winning, gasped Oliver. But it was too late. Oliver lay, bruised and bemused, bunkered down in the turntable well. Duck surveyed the damage. Hello, Oliver. Are you being a good, gracious engine? Beg pardon, of course, but we really don't like this sort of surprise. Donald and Douglas will miss their turntable until it is mended. That evening, Oliver was hauled gently to safety. I'm sorry, sir, he said to the fat controller. I should have listened to Duck's advice. I don't feel good gracious, whatever it is. I just feel silly. Well, Oliver, replied the fat controller, now you know the damage trucks can do. Yes, I do, sir groaned Oliver. I look like a load of scrap iron. Ho, ho. Oh, I don't think so, laughed the fat controller. But you do need to go to the works to be mended. The other engines now felt sorry for Oliver. The branch line won't be the same without you, whistled Duck. Come back soon. A few days later, Oliver did come back. His coat gleamed brighter than ever. He was a wiser engine, too, and never made a mistake about trucks again. Duck was waiting for his next journey. Near him stood a red bus, but he didn't look friendly like Bertie. The bus growled as he gazed at the happy passengers. Stupid nonsense, he grumbled. I wouldn't have brought them if I'd known. I'd have had a breakdown or something. I'm glad you didn't, smiled Duck. You'd have spoiled their fun. Ah, enjoyment is all you engines live for. One day, railways will be ripped up. Duck felt shocked at such an idea. We have a friend called Bertie, and he's a bus, but he likes the railway. Sometimes he teases us about it, but he'd never want to see it ripped up. Huh, growled the bus. I know Bertie. He's too small in size to be of any use. Duck took no notice. That evening, the engines were preparing for the homeward rush. Where are the passengers? They wondered. Look, shrilled Oliver. Look at Bulgy. He's a mean scarlet deceiver. Bulgy was wearing a large sign saying railway bus. Yeah, boo snubs, he jeered as he roared away. Come on, puffed Duck to his coaches. Let's see what he's up to. Duck wanted to pay Bulgy out, but he wasn't sure how. Then, in the distance, Duck saw a man waving a red flag. That meant danger. The line here crosses a narrow road, and there was Bulgy, wedged firmly under the bridge. So this was his shortcut, chuckled Duck. He tricked us, shouted Bulgy's passengers. He said he was a railway bus, 
but he wouldn't accept our return tickets. He wanted us to think railways are no good. Duck's crew examined the bridge. It's risky, but we must help the passengers. Passengers are urgent, agreed Duck. Duck slowly and carefully set off across the bridge. Bulgy wailed as he felt the bridge quiver. Stop! he shouted. It might fall on me. That would serve you right for telling lies, said Duck. But the bridge didn't collapse. Later, Gordon steamed into the yard at the big station. That's what I need, exclaimed Gordon. There, emerging out of the sheds, were two shiny tenders. Now, if I had two tenders, said Gordon, I wouldn't need to stop so often and I wouldn't have to listen to silly little engines. Those tenders belong to a visitor, replied his driver. Diesel sidled up alongside. Everyone knows that tenders are a mark of distinction, but I'm afraid that no amount of tenders will save you in the end. We diesels are taking over, and we don't need tenders to make us important. Not even one. Gordon was most upset. He backed down onto his train, hissing mournfully. Cheer up, Gordon, said the fat controller. I can't, sir. Is it true what Diesel says, sir? What does he say? That Diesel's are taking over. Don't worry, Gordon, that will never happen on my railway. And one more thing, sir. Why did the visitor have two tenders? Because he lives on a railway with long distances between coal and depots. Gordon felt better. But Henry stopped at complaining. He banged some trucks angrily. I always work hard enough for two, he puffed. I deserve another tender. Duck whispered something to Donald. He was going to play a trick on Henry. Henry, he asked innocently, would you like my tenders? Yours? What have you got to do with tenders? All right, said Duck. The deal's off. Would you like them, Donald? I wouldn't need to deprive you of the honour replied Donald. It is a great honour, continued Duck thoughtfully, but I'm only a tank engine. Perhaps James might. I'm sorry I was rude, said Henry hastily. How many tenders have you, and when could I have them? Uh, um, I have six, and you can have them this evening. Six lovely tenders, chortled Henry. What a splendid sight I'll be. Henry was excited all day. Do you think it'll be all right? He asked for the umpteenth time. Of course, said Duck. They're all ready now. The other engines waited where they could each get a good view. But Henry wasn't a splendid sight at all. His six tenders were very old, dirty, and filled with boiler sludge. Had a good washout, Henry, called a voice. That's right, you'll feel a different engine now. He was just shunting, ready for his return journey, when... That sounds like a steam engine, he thought. The hiss came again. Who's there? asked Douglas. A whisper came. Are you a fat controller's engine? I am prudent. Thank goodness. I'm Oliver, and I'm with my brake van towed. We've run out of coal and have no more steam. But what are you doing? Escaping. From what? Scrap. Douglas shivered. Then he remembered Edward's story about saving Trevor. I'll be glad to help you, he said. It'll have to look as if you're ready for scrap, and I'm taking you away. The drivers and firemen agree to help too. Everyone work fast. No time to turn around, panted Douglas. I'll run tender first. Come on.
But before they could clear the station, they were stopped. Aha! exclaimed the foreman. A Great Western engine and a brake van, too. You can't take these. Ah, but they're all for us, said Douglas's driver. See for yourself. The foreman looked all over Oliver. Seems in order. Right, away, guard. That was a neat thing, puffed Douglas. We've had worse, smiled Oliver. And they forged ahead. It was daylight when their journey ended. We're home, cried Douglas. Shh, said his driver. There are the works. We'll find a place for Oliver. Oliver said goodbye and thank you, and Douglas puffed away. The next day, Douglas told the other engines all about Oliver. The fat controller will have to know, said James. Douglas should tell him at once, added Gordon. Well, here he is said a voice. Now, what's this all about? Beg pardon, sir, but we do need another engine. Yes, sir, ventured Gordon. A steam engine, sir. I'm afraid that unless one is saved from scrap, there's little hope. But, sir, burst out Douglas, one has. Yes, indeed. And thanks to you, Douglas, he is now at our works. Oliver is just what we need for Duck's branch line. Gusts of wind swirled flakes of snow towards Thomas, then they swooshed round Percy too. Why don't we talk about something else, shivered Percy? Yes, like how silly we look when our funnels turn into icicles. That's not funny. Maybe we'll stop feeling cold if we talk about warm things like sunshine and steam. And fire lighters, muttered Thomas. Scarves, continued Percy. Scarves? That's what you need, Percy, a woolly scarf round your funnel. Thomas was only teasing, but Percy thought happily about scarves until the firelighter came. Percy was now working hard. His fire was burning nicely and he had plenty of steam. But he still thought about scarves. He saw them everywhere he went. My funnel's cold, my funnel's cold, he puffed. I want a scarf, I want a scarf. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry. Engines don't wear scarves. Engines with proper funnels do, replied Percy. You've only got a small one. Before Henry could answer, Percy puffed away. Percy was still being cheeky. His driver always shut off steam just outside the station. Percy wanted to surprise the coaches by coming in as quietly as he could. But the porters didn't hear him either. Boxes and bags burst everywhere. Oh! groaned Percy. Sticky streams of jam trickled down Percy's face. A top hat hung on his lamp iron. Worst of all, a pair of trousers coiled lovingly round his funnel. Everyone was very angry. The fat controller seized the top hat. Mine, he said. Percy, look at this. Yes, sir, I am, sir. My best trousers, too. Yes, sir. Please, sir. We must pay the passengers for their spoiled clothes, and my trousers are ruined. I hope this will teach you not to play tricks with the coaches. Percy went off to the yard. He felt very silly. On the way, he met James. Hello, Percy. So you found the scarf, eh? But legs go in trousers, not funnels. And he puffed away to tell Henry the news. Bad weather's due. My help's always needed. Mind how you go, Percy. Ah, off, Percy. As long as I've got rails to run on, I can go anywhere in any weather, anyhow. Goodbye. He set off for the beach. 
It was a beautiful day, but Edward was worried. Be careful, he warned. There's a storm coming. A promise is a promise, thought Percy, no matter what the weather. The children had a lovely day, but by tea time, dark clouds loomed ahead. Annie and Clarabel were glad when Percy arrived. He was just in time. Rain streamed down Percy's boiler. Oh, he shivered and thought of his nice dry shed. Percy struggled on past coastal villages and into the countryside. The river was rising fast. I wish I could see, I wish I could see, complained Percy, as he battled against the rain. More trouble lay ahead. Oh, hissed Percy, the water is sloshing my fire. Percy's driver and fireman had to find some more firewood. I'll have some of your floorboards, please, said the fireman to the guard. I only swept the floor this morning, grumbled the guard, but he still helped. Soon, Percy's fire was burning well. He felt warm and comfortable again. Then, he saw Harold. Oh, dear thought Percy. Harold's come to laugh at me. Something thudded onto Percy's boiler. Ow! exclaimed Percy. He needn't throw things. It's a parachute, laughed his driver. Harold's dropping hot drinks for us. Thank you, Harold, whistled Percy. Good to be of service, replied Harold, and he buzzed away. Water lapped Percy's wheels. Percy was losing steam again, but he plunged bravely on. I promised, he panted, I promised. He made one more big effort, and at last, exhausted but triumphant, he brought the train home. Well done, Percy, cheered Thomas. You kept your promise despite everything. Fat controller arrived. Your parts are worn, Toby, so you must go to the works to be mended. Can I take Henrietta, sir? No. What would the passengers do without her? Toby saw Percy by the water tower. Don't worry, Toby, said Percy. I'll take care of Henrietta until you get back. Soon Toby was out on the main line. He clanked as he trundled along. He's a little engine with small wheels. His tanks don't hold much water. He had come a long way and began to feel thirsty. In the distance was a signal. Good, he thought. There's a station ahead. I can have a nice drink and a rest until James has passed. Toby's driver thought so too. Toby was enjoying his drink when the signalman came up. He had never seen Toby before. Toby's driver tried to explain, but the new signalman wouldn't listen. We must clear the line for James with the express. You'll have to get more water at the next station. Toby clanked sadly away. Hurrying used a lot of water, and his tanks were soon empty. Poor Toby was out of steam and stranded on the main line. We must warn James, said the fireman. Then he saw Percy and Henrietta. Please, take me back to the station. It's an emergency. Henrietta hated leaving Toby. Never mind, said Percy. You're taking the fireman to warn James. That's a big help. Henrietta felt much better. James was fuming when he heard the news. I'm going to be late. My fault, said the signalman. I didn't understand about Toby. Now, James, said his driver, you'll have to push Toby. What, me? Me? Push Toby and pull my train too? Grumbling dreadfully, James set off to find Toby.
he came up behind Toby and gave him a bump. Get on, you! James had to work very hard. When he reached the workstation, he felt exhausted. Some children were on the platform. Coo said one. The Express is late and it's got two engines. I think James couldn't pull it on his own, so Toby had to help him. Never mind, James, whispered Toby. They're only joking. Ha ha, said James. It was an important day in the yard. Everyone was busy and excited, making notes and taking photographs. A special visitor had arrived and was now the centre of attention. Who's that? whispered Thomas to Duck. That, said Duck proudly, is a celebrity. Oh, good riddance, Gordon grumbled, chattering all night. Who is he, anyway? Duck told you, said Thomas. He's famous. As famous as me, huffed Gordon. Nonsense. He's famouser than you, replied Thomas. He went a hundred miles an hour before you were thought of. So he says, snorted Gordon. But I didn't like his looks. He's got no dome. Never trust domeless engines. They're not respectable. I never boast, but I'd say that a hundred miles an hour would be easy for me. Duck took some trucks to Edward's station. Hello, called Edward. That famous engine came through this morning. He whistled to me. Wasn't he kind? He's the finest engine in the world, replied Duck. Then he told Edward what Gordon had said. Take no notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. Look. He's coming now. Gordon's wheels pounded the rails. He did it, I'll do it. He did it, I'll do it. Gordon's train rocketed past and was gone. He'll knock himself to bits, chuckled Duck. Steady, Gordon, called his driver. We aren't running a race. We are, then, said Gordon, but he said it to himself. Suddenly, Gordon began to feel a little strange. The top of my boiler seems funny, he thought. It feels as if something is loose. I'd better go slower. But it was too late. On the viaduct, they met the wind. It was a teasing wind which blew suddenly in hard puffs. Gordon thought it wanted to push him off the bridge. No, you don't, he said firmly, but the wind had other ideas. It curled around his boiler, crept under his loose dome and lifted it off and away into the valley below. Gordon was most uncomfortable. The cold wind was whistling through the hole where his dome should be and he felt silly without it. At the big station, the trucks laughed at him. Gordon tried to wish them away, but they crowded round no matter what he did. Duck enjoyed exploring every curve and corner of the line. Sea breezes swirled his smoke high into the air and his green paint glistened in the sunlight. This is just like being on holiday, he puffed. Well, you know what they say, laughed his driver. A change is as good as a rest. Soon, Duck was busier than ever. The fat controller was building a new station at the port and Duck pushed the trucks wherever they were needed. Bertie looked after Duck's passengers and the other engines helped too, but the work took a long time. Noise and dust filled the air. Don't worry, whistled Toby. The station's nearly finished. And on time too, said Duck, thankfully. Duck felt his responsibility deeply and talked endlessly.
endlessly about it. You don't understand, Donald, how much the Fat Controller relies on me. Ach, I muttered Donald sleepily. I'm Great Western and I... Quack, quack, quack. What? You heard. Quack, quack, you go. Sounds like you're an egg laid. Now wish and let an engine sleep. Quack yourself, said Doc indignantly. Later, he spoke to his driver. Donald says I quack as if I'd laid an egg. Quack, do you, pondered his fireman. He whispered something to Duck and his driver. They were going to play a joke on Donald and pay him back for teasing Duck. The engines were busy for the rest of the day and nothing more was said. Not even a quack. But when at last Donald was asleep, Duck's driver and fireman popped something into his water tank. Next morning, when Donald stopped for water, he found that he had an unexpected passenger aboard. A small white duckling popped out of his water tank. Nay, do who's behind this? laughed Donald. The duckling was tame. She shared the fireman's sandwiches and rolled in the tender. The other engines enjoyed teasing Donald about her. Presently, she grew tired of travelling and hopped off at a station, and there she stayed. The station master explained to Thomas's driver that the school bus had broken down and that all the parents would be worried if the children were late. Thomas waited as the children walked down from the bridge. Then he took them to the next station, where Bertie was waiting to take them home. When Thomas finished his journey, he was very late. He was worried that the fat controller might be cross with him. I warn Thomas, puffed Percy to James. He's been late one time too many. He'll be in trouble now. But next morning, the fat controller was nowhere to be seen. Thank goodness, sighed Thomas. Thomas knows every part of his branch line, but just ahead was a stretch where the hot sun had bent the rails on the track. Careful, Thomas, called his driver, but it was too late. That's done it, said his driver. We shan't get any further today. But what about my passengers? Don't worry, they'll be looked after, replied his driver. While workmen repaired the line, Thomas had to shunt trucks in the yard. Bertie came to see him. I understand you need my help again. Yes, Bertie, replied Thomas sadly. I can't run without my rails. Bertie set off to collect Thomas's passengers. Hello, Bertie, they said. We are glad you are here. Bertie drove along the road by the railway. He stopped at each station along the line. Sometimes he stopped between stations to let people off closer to their homes. Thomas felt miserable. I've lost my passengers. They like Bertie better than me. The fat controller arrived. Your branch line is repaired. I'm going to change your timetable so that you and Bertie can work together more. When Thomas reached the station, there were all his passengers. Bertie is a very good bus, but we missed our train rides with you, they said. Later, Thomas spoke to Bertie. Thank you for looking after my passengers. Oh, that's all right, Thomas. I like to make new friends, but I'm glad to share them with you. Bertie, said Thomas, you're a very good friend indeed. Next day, the fat controller arrived. I would like you to go to the harbour tonight to collect something rather unusual. What sort of something? Wait and see. 
Percy was moving trucks into a siding. Henry arrived with his goods train. The signalman switched the points and Percy waited on the siding until Henry had steamed by. Then there was trouble. The points are jammed, called the signalman. I can't switch them back. The workmen will mend them in the morning. It's too late now. Hmm, said Percy's driver. I'm sorry, Percy, but you will have to stay here for the night. Where are you going? asked Percy. Home for tea, replied the fireman. Percy was speechless. He watched as the other engines went home to the shed. Night time came and Percy began to feel very lonely. Oh dear, he murmured, it's very dark. <whistles> oh, oh, what's that? It was only an owl, but Percy didn't realise this. I wish Thomas was here too, he sighed. Thomas was waiting for his mysterious load at the harbour. Suddenly, there it was. Cinders and ashes, cried Thomas. It's a dragon. Don't worry, laughed his driver. This dragon is made of paper. It's for the carnival tomorrow. Workmen lifted the dragon onto Thomas's low loader and put lights all around it for protection. Then Thomas set off into the misty night. Percy was asleep in his sidings and had no idea that Thomas was approaching him. Help! cried Percy. I'm not going to open my eyes until my driver comes. Next morning, the points were mended and Percy puffed back to the junction. Gordon was just about to leave with the express. You'll never guess what I saw last night. Gordon was in no mood for puzzles. I'm a busy engine. I don't have time for your games. I've seen a huge dragon. It was covered in lights. Gordon snorted. You've been in the sun too long. Your dome has cracked. <laughs> 